That's awesome. Just... Thank you. Uh, so calling the meeting to order of the March 20th Development Review Board, and we will first uh, have Meredith review the remote meeting procedures. All right. So I'm going to share my screen, which is mostly for um, people who are watching via Orca Media. What, you're not supposed to hear it. It's not going to be broadcast through the speaker up there because there's only a few people here. So you're going to hear me. <laughs> the mic is, is for coming, is remotely. Through? Is the sound coming through? Okay. Um, oh, sorry, I've got multiple people here coming in. All right. Nope. Now I know I'm just, I had to let people in. So it gives me I'm trying to do too many things. All right. So for anyone who is watching tonight's development review board meeting via Orca Media, you can participate in tonight's meeting via the Zoom platform um, through either video or telephone access options. So if you are joining us over the internet, you can type this link into your web browser and it will bring you into the Zoom platform and then I'll let you into the meeting. Um, alternatively, you can dial in on this phone number when prompted, plug in this meeting ID. Um, and again, I'll get prompted and let you into the meeting. If anyone is having problems accessing the meeting, please email me at mcrandall at montpelier-vt.org. I will be monitoring my email throughout the meeting. Um, for those attending via Zoom, please make sure that your Zoom name includes both your first and last name so that we know who we're speaking with. And this will also assist the recording secretary. Um, note that turning your video on is optional. Also, for everyone attending, please keep your microphone on mute when you're not speaking. This helps reduce background noise. Um, a final note, the Zoom chat function should only be used for troubleshooting or logistics questions. Um, if you have questions or comments about an item on the agenda, please raise your hand, either physically or by using the raise hand button on your toolbar. Um, I don't think we have anybody on via phone, but if somebody's listening via Orca and then decides to call in over the phone, you can use uh, press star nine on your phone. And this gives shows everybody on Zoom a little hand icon so that we know that you're raising your hand and want to speak. Um, if you have raised your name to speak, please wait for the chair to recognize you. And then once you've been recognized, um, if you're muted, make sure you unmute yourself and please state your name and address for the record. Um, in the event the public is unable to access the meeting, it will need to be continued to a time and place certain. I will now hand the meeting back over to the chair. Okay, um, the first item is uh, review and approval of the agenda. So moved. Okay. Um, we'll try to speak up. Well, yep, we can speak up. We can also, there's a speaker on that column in front of you. So we'll also turn that on. Um, it, it gets a little funky, but that way. Please let us know if you can't hear. Okay. Great. Oh, um, was that you? It's <laughs> okay. So there's a motion from Kevin. Second. To approve the agenda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Hi. Oh, hi, Abby. Oh, is Abby on? Yeah. Great. Um, so this is a continuation of the uh, Isabel. Uh, actually, first let's um let's do the uh review and approval of the previous minutes. Um, and we should also introduce the members. I'm sorry. You introduce the members. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. No, you are starting it with right. <laughs> that that's why I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> Jean Leon, board member. Kevin O'Connell, board member. Meredith Crandall, staff. Sharon Allen, vice chair. Jill Kiernan, board member. Abby, do you want to introduce yourself? Then Abby White, board member. Michael home today? No, Michael can't make it. Okay. I believe that's all. Oops. Um. So I uh, presume everyone has had a chance to review the minutes. Um, were there any changes that were needed? 
for the meeting that I attended. I was uh, here on the 21st and that was fine. Any other comments? To approve the minutes. Moved on both sets of minutes. Both of them? Yes. Okay. okay. Yes. Yeah. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Okay. Um, so we are here for a continuation of the um, uh, final subdivision and major site plan review uh, for Isabel Circle. Um, I think it would be helpful uh, if we could get Meredith to do just a quick overview of kind of where we were from uh, what information was missing and uh, that we were looking for at the end of the hearing. And uh, then we'll go from there. I can do that. Um, I think... I, I know we have at least one person who's new, Kurt Modica, who might be giving testimony. So we should probably swear in anybody new. Okay. Um, I don't have my little script. That's that. okay. You, I'm assuming. You um, is there anyone else uh, here or online who is interested in testifying tonight? Who hasn't? I mean, you, you continue to be sworn in from the last one, but if anybody who didn't okay. testify at the last one. All those who were not sworn in before and would like to be testified tonight, please raise your right hand. That's you two, Kurt, in the back. You <laughs> solemnly swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. I do. Okay. Um, so, yeah, okay. Meredith, if you just get the overview, that'd be great. So, um, I'm going to keep this fairly short and try and stick to the, the high points. Um, and for uh, anybody here in the audience, there is a packet of the new material on the table, including the memo that I'm kind of using here as my crib sheet for the new stuff. Um, so feel free to take a look at that if you wanted to. Um, so you just want a uh, note of what still needs to be resolved. Um, maybe if we could, um, I think it, I think it's worth going quickly through the resolved. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Um, so what I determined seemed. To, to look at as resolved and the board members, it's not like the board members can't ask questions about it again. Um, but my understanding is that we resolved that one, the the phasing of this project, the first phase is actually going to be to build the full road and the stormwater infrastructure prior to building on the individual parcels. Um, so this dealt with the issue in the first staff report about whether there needed to be a condition of approval on building in hammerheads or other needs on the road for allowing people to turn around while there are people living there, building there. That's that's not an issue anymore. Um, applicant also agreed to shift parcel boundaries so that parcel 26 um, and others intended for dwelling units contain the necessary area. Um, the new road is going to be designed for a speed limit of 25 miles per hour and crowned as requested by DPW. And um, there's also going to be underground conduits for utilities. Um, the applicant also attested to um, parcel lines having been drawn to allow for renewable energy design options on the individual parcels as practical, um, while noting that they also you know, needed to meet the other zoning requirements of subdivision um, and accounting for the natural grade of the property. So there's, you know, some parcels may have a little bit more difficulty, but they did the best they could with where they're at. Um, conditions of approval that seem to be agreed upon during the hearing um, was applicant agreeing to submitting signed and sealed engineered plans related to the steep slopes aspect of the project um, prior to permit issuance, um, agreeing to maintain the common land parcel for passive recreation as a condition of subdivision permit approval. Um, also happy to use the DPW's preferred street lights. And then that's a, a detail that can be, be dealt with after the fact. Um, but we know that that's there and would be in a finding of fact of the decision. And then the board during the meeting seemed to be um, on board, sorry, uh, with having the draft owners association documents be recorded in the San Diego city land records with the final subdivision plat um, versus having to take a look at them during the hearing process. Um, it's not like there were votes on these things, but this is the sense I got from what was said. Um, the board did request guidance from Department of Public Works on the bike and pedestrian master plan and typology process for triggering upgrades to roads and sidewalks, as well as an overview of the um, 
MOU process that the city goes through for transferring of private streets to the city, uh, city streets. And so we did get responses from Department of Public Works and the new materials. Um, and those are included on that table if anybody wants to look at the originals. Um, so we did get a new plan set from the applicant um, and that addressed many of the things I noted here as well as some others that were brought up, um, including we got inputs from the parks director and the chair of the tree board on landscaping. So there's a revised landscaping plan in that packet um, that seems to address those landscaping comments. Um, and as well as the road being widened um, to 24 feet. Um, and that addressed comments both from the Department of Public Works about there's some concerns about safety and making sure the larger vehicles can get by um, potentially parked vehicles as well as dealing with um, winter width issues um, and also addressing a request from the Parks Department to make sure that there was some potential for on-street parking for access to the adjacent city park. Okay. Um, so that's been dealt with in those plans. And then um, there's there's a lot of information in there from DPW on, like I said, the bike and pedestrian master plan. I think you guys can can talk about yeah. that when you get there. Yeah. Um, there were some specifics about, you know, water main tweaks. Um, the big thing from DPW that seems to be sort of un, un answered as of the packet um, was uh, requests for some more data supporting the 25 year storm design for the stormwater plan and some additional details on where the drainage would go once it leaves the retention ponds. Um, there were a couple tweaky things from the staff report that we still need to get to, but that's in the memo. Okay. Does that help yes. what you need? That does, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Oh. You're welcome. I, I get my intonation at this point would um, be to hear from the applicant about what they've changed and what they've updated to just sort of, so everybody has that information, even if you haven't been receiving the packets. Um, and then for, um, it might also be helpful just uh, for you to kind of review what the MOU process is. Are you there? Oh, who's here? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So do applicant first and then Kurt? Yeah. So if you could just kind of overview what you've changed and, and sort of how up to speed we are, that would be great. Thank you. Um, yeah, so thanks, Meredith. That was a great overview. Um, we did submit new drawings, and the drawings were targeted, and all the changes were to respond directly to the comments. So even though there's a lot of sheets there, um, the prevalence of all the contours, basically, you know, there's contours on many of the sheets, um, the road widths on many of the sheets. So those changes were... Um, the changes to, to make the road from 22 feet to 24 foot in width um, to crown the road um, in accordance with DPW's um, request, um, that change was made. Um, and then parking, we had a conversation with um, the Parks Department and DPW uh, relating to signage, providing um, no parking signage at the intersections to prohibit parking within 50 feet. Um, and then how that um, interface would occur um, with the publicly owned land um, and and where where the um, publicly owned land abuts the uh, Isabel Circle where that nears its termination uh, along the western I'm sorry the southern side the plan left um, of the of the project um, and then um, what I those are generally the overview of the changes um, I guess what I could do is some of the outstanding ones that Meredith mentioned related to, to stormwater. Um, I have those numbers that, that available that I could, could share. Um, we prepared those calculations when we prepared the, store, the state stormwater permit. Um, and the, we received those comments um, late Thursday um, from Meredith. So our schedules just didn't overlap on, um, and on Friday and Monday. Um, so um, I would have hoped that I could have shared that with, um, you know, no Kurt prior to the meeting, but I think um, hopefully I can step through it with the board um, and Kurt um, during the hearing here. Uh, share the drawings and how we looked at where the rainwater fell and and where it's going um and how we calculated the, the peak storm events okay um it seems to me that that stormwater is one of the bigger outstanding questions that we have um the other thing is it seemed like there were some changes made to uh landscaping in the tree plan is that yep. correct yeah, yeah and so i can share those i'll, I'll share the um 
do screen share now and we can we can look at the landscaping plan together and then the stormwater plan together as well. Okay. Um, what do board members think? Do we want to kind of step through that process and then maybe hear from the Department of Public Works? Or... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm hoping that some of this will um, clarify, you know, influence, well, well, not influence, but inform <laughs> Chris Kurtz, you know, comments so that maybe, you know, okay. if, if he talks, then I'll be like, well, I would share okay. that uh, okay. immediately afterwards. Great. Let me try to share it on Zoom here. So looking at the planting plan, we oh, hold on. That comes out a little funky. Do you guys see that okay? Or I might need to change the aspect ratio. Is that okay? I, I mean, mean it's not perfect, but it is okay. readable. All right. We'll leave it. It looks normal on my screen. Yeah, there's something it's the projector. The projector is a little funky. It did something weird to the proportions. So looking at the trees and long hair, um, we pushed them back behind the sidewalk, um, further back from the right of way, um, beyond where the swale is to keep them out of where the, the snow is being plowed. Um, down in the planting legend in the lower right corner here, we've introduced additional species. Um, some um, maples, ginkgos, um, the London uh, plane tree, um, the white, uh, this the swamp white oak, um, and a triumphant elm. So um, that's more species to, to induce more of a variety along the um, the streetscapes of the um, of the project. So that's in in accordance with the Parks Department's um, um, wishes. Okay. Um, see the. So now looking at the stormwater, um, this is the pre-development area and there's three different drainage areas. So um, down here in the lower left, there's EX1 and that's this area drains to the bo bottom left of the page, which is to the Southeast of the project. Um, EX2 drains to the, to the Northeast of the project. And then EX3 drains towards the North. Um, and so, what we what we do is why we um, delineate this in the existing conditions is once you build the project and build the roads, the the area where the stormwater flows may not be the same area. So we want to make sure that we do an apples to apples comparison so that the existing flows that are going to those three points we look at in the post development conditions that they're the same. Um, but by not making sure that your your drainage areas represent um, the pre and the post accurately, then you're not doing apples apples comparison. So that's the goal at looking at the um, existing areas. In the proposed areas. If you need to, you can move that microphone around the other way so you don't have to keep sure. going back and forth. It might be a little easier Thank you. for you. Yeah. Um, oh. so, so in the proposed areas, we use those same three um, discharge locations um, labeled as SN1, which matches up with existing conditions one. But as you can see, the drainage boundaries of that has changed. Um, and then in the um, also the EX2 matches up with PR2. And then um, SN3 matches up with EX3. And we have two separate um, stormwater treatment practices in there, the 3P and the 4P, and we combine those. And when we looked at where the water flows, um, and not only did we look at each of these three areas that the, the discharge rates are lower, um, we've also looked that that does not go towards Blackwell or Taplin Street, which is up on the, the north um, west portion, um, the page uh, top right of the project. There's this boundary here, generally. All of the water that comes out of the project 
remains to the bottom of this line. And it follows a rather defined channel. Um, surveyor and myself um, and an engineer walked along this route up and down to make sure that the water was not going further um, towards the page top, which is further west um, towards Blackland and Tapple streets. So um, looking at the, the discharge locations, um, now we look at after in the post-development conditions, the water flows through um, these four different, um, they're constructed gravel wetlands. So they provide treatment through the gravel media, but then they also gather and um, hold back it in similar to like a pond, a constructed pond. So looking at these three discharge locations, we made sure for the state requirements, those discharge flows are less for the 10 year event. Um, but then in addition, using that same, the same analysis in that same area, increasing the rainfall event to the 25 year storm for to meet the city standards. So the storm that occurs on average once every 25 years that those discharge rates um, are, are lower. And so, um, so, I'm sorry, so lower than what the discharge is now, it, lower than what the discharge is now. Um, and I, I hesitate to, to go through like number, no one wants to hear numbers just read out, but being, I didn't get a chance to go through this with Kurt. Um, let me just kind of step through each of those three locations with the numbers and how they've changed from the, the pre-development conditions to the post-development conditions. Um, so for, for the, um, that discharge point one in the existing conditions, it was 2.67 cubic feet per second. And then in the post-development conditions, it's 2.31, so 2.6 to 2.3. Um, at um, discharge point two, it was um, in the pre-development um, conditions, it is um, 1.79 and it's reduced to 1.7, so slightly less, 1.79 to 1.7. And then at the third location, it goes from 3.5 uh, down to 3.3. So at each of those three locations, um, during the 25 year storm event, it's slightly less. And that, that's true also um, to meet um, the state requirements during the 10 year storm event. Um, and it's less because of the way you've set it up? It, it, it's less because the water, all of the water from the developed impervious areas, it, it's gathered in the, the along the, at first, you know, it sheet flows across the, the lawns in the areas and eventually either meets um, a constructed swale or a um, curb line and then pipes and then it's brought into each of those stormwater areas and it and it fills up and it goes through a smaller orifice small hole so that it, it comes out at, at a slower rate um, so it does not overwhelm the, the downstream properties okay um th that's um that's and I'm happy if Kurt has any additional questions or, or wants to dive into it. I'm, I'm happy to to go into it um, in more detail. Um, the the one of the um, and this plan shows it well. So um, the previous plans that we submitted uh, across all of these roads, the contours were straight um, because we had it sloping to one side of the road. Um, and DPW expressed an interest in having it normally crowned where the, the high point of the road is at the center line. So that was one of the reasons that all of the plans were updated is each, each of these lines, um, you know, it went from a straight line to having a little kink in it. Um, and it kind of populates through each of the plans. Um, when we did that, we also looked at where now you're switching the side of the road, but the water goes from one side of the road to, to, to splitting it 50, 50. And we made sure, um, that, that water still went to the same treatment practice that we had previously assumed it did and and, and it does. Okay. Um, one of the DPW um, comments was related to water main type. Um, we proposed uh, it's typically the PVC pipe. Um, they're looking, if I understand their comment correctly, um, for a another type of plastic instead of PVC, um, high density polyethylene pipe. Um, and so I want to work through them and fully understand that comment. But I think um, through the um, their review of the water system application at the state level, um, we, we can definitely make them satisfied with the, the water infrastructure that we're proposing. I think that's the... Go ahead. 
Yeah, this is Kurt um, um, from DBW. Uh, thank you for that overview. Um, I just have, you know, one follow-up question on the stormwater, you know, um, acknowledging that our zoning standards call for the 25-year storm. I'm just curious if you can um, uh, determine where the actual runoff will connect to the city storm system. So just to make sure we don't have any um, any issues downstream on a larger storm event um, on our existing storm system that would um, you know cause us problems down the road. And I'm, and it's okay if you don't have that now, but uh, that was uh, the intent of my comment there is to see where it actually collect, connects to the city's uh, collection system. Yes, um, to the north of the project, um, there's the Green Mountain, um, the, G the GMP, the Green Mountain Power um, Transformer Station, and there is a rather deep um, stream and ditch that goes into a culvert um, located um, right here. Um, so that's where it goes to the north of the project. Um, to the south, or to the east of the project, the... Um, these locations here generally just enter like shallow channelized flow um, and carry to the to the east. Um, let me see if I get a get a larger um, overall view here. I think early on we have a. So it, yeah, it it goes to the east um, in these two locations and generally flows um, easterly. So I don't have the exact location um, which culvert that the flow is going to the east um, would enter the, the city system. But but it would be during a twenty five year storm event. It would be at a, a lesser rate than than currently exists. So you expect it would would be split sort of on these. Um the SN1 would be split between a various number of storm collection system points? No, I, I think it will be, um, it may be, these two may go into a, a, you know, a constructed storm drain at the same location, or it might be, you know, it might go into two separate ones. Um, I don't have the contours here at the, this meeting to, to show you, you know, where, where, where it would exactly um, meet. Okay. Um, and on the water system, you know, I'm happy to work through that with you. I don't, I don't see any issues with, you know, changing the pipe type and and getting that up um, to DPW standards. Okay. Uh, Kurt, do you um, is the Department of Public Works going to need to know um, where that where that water is going to end up before it would sort of give its blessings to this? Uh, I I do think uh, that is important just for us to uh, look at. If, if that's something you could pull off from LIDAR data, Jeff, that would be helpful for us just to understand uh, potential impacts in larger storm events. I'm seeing, trying to see what we can glean here um, from this map. This is LiDAR data here um, showing on this map. Um, the, the problem is it's not very defined in, in where, um, it, which catch basin it would go into. Um, but, but we're going to try our best um, and get that information to you. Great. Thank you. Nice. Can I just clarify the standard for this meeting? That was the twenty-five year. Is that correct? Or the um, yeah. So this this the the design standard is the twenty-five year, um, but because so like right now the water that falls up there sort of spreads out more, right? And so it's going to get have a discharge point from these two stormwater catch basins. Right. So it's going to sort of focus where that water gets discharged now. So even though we've got this 25 year storm design, um, 
there's still the potential concentration of water in different spaces. So there might still end up being, right. Could there still end up being more, I guess, no, because you're, you said you're designing it. So it discharges less at that individual point, right? Yes. Yeah, so so Where it's looking different. at the contours at the edge of the project area, right? generally all of that area will have concentrated in the channel, shallow channelized flow into two, two the basin. routes. So the, these, I believe that selecting for this project, three discrete locations is the way to analyze um, right. that, that it, we're not impacting downstream drainage systems. Right. And so that. So you've analyzed when you say yeah. that flow for the, even for the 25 year storm event, the discharge from one of those basins at that distinct point, even from a 25 year storm event, is a lower discharge than it would be currently for any discharge or for the 25 year storm event now? How does that, like when you do your comparison, right? It's the discharge at 25 year storm is still less than what it discharges now on like an everyday event. Is that what you mean by less than? No, no less than a, a, a pre, in the a current pre, a, a twenty-five current, years. Yes. Okay. So I, I feel confident we are not making the the city's infrastructure, um, the, the whatever they're experiencing now during the twenty-five year event, will not be made any worse. Mm -hmm. Will be less. So that your numbers are lower. Correct. Given that in the twenty-five year, event. right? I, I cannot tell you. I can't. T unfortunately, during this hearing, I can't tell you which culvert it's going to. But whatever culvert it's going to, it is not any worse. Yeah. Okay. Kurt, did you have any other questions? Uh, no, I mean, I think, you know, my point of looking at larger storm events is, and, then, and I did acknowledge, you know, that this, the design criteria is based on the 25 year. It's just for our department to know. Um, you know, to be proactive, if if we have a you know an area that's you know existing problematic and um, that we can do maintenance ahead of time for the development, um, and just kind of planning for larger storm events, knowing that you know we will at some point get larger storm events than twenty five year, um, it's just going to allow us to be proactive um, on our maintenance. So. It, I don't think it it needs to hold up this approval. I just uh, I'd just be great follow up information if you could do your best estimate, Jeff, um, for us. We can certainly do that. Okay. Um. The staff notes I have here a discussion about whether existing Isabel Circle sidewalk construction is necessary. And I'm not quite sure where that came from. I mean, it's because um, I wasn't here. Um, <laughs> uh, it would seem to me that it is, but well, that's I mean, the question. Yeah, be because there were so many comments about sidewalk needs on the the existing Isabel Circle and some points raised by Department of Public Works about um, connecting Hebert sidewalk to the proposed new Isabel Circle sidewalks and then development. There was a question um, about whether the city's infrastructure on Isabel Circle existing needed to be upgraded, right, for the demand of the new location. Um, and the new information from Department of Public Works confirmed that under the city's bike and pedestrian plan um, and the way that system works, the Isabel Circle existing um, does not currently warrant sidewalk. And, and Kurt, feel free to pipe up after I have my little summary um, if I've misstated something um, and that they really, they could not say for certain that adding these new 31 buildable parcels and the the units on them, they could not say for certain that even that would then warrant sidewalk on existing Isabel Circle. On existing Isabel Circle. On existing Isabel Circle. Okay. So there's no question about sidewalk within the new development. Okay. It's connecting that to Hebert. 
um, that was a bit of a question. And um, so, you know, Department of Public Works made a note that, oh, uh, yep. yeah, you can, thanks. Thanks, Paul. Um, that, you know, when it comes down to transfer of responsibility for the new sidewalks in this proposed development, um, the Department of Public Works would not be in favor of going to city council and asking to have that transferred to the city until there was a continuous sidewalk all the way through. Um, but again, there's no, there's no like zoning requirement as far as we can tell, especially when there's no evidence that this new development triggers enough, enough additional, foot additional, traffic. yeah, additional foot traffic that well, additional foot traffic that then means that the city has to spend money on adding that sidewalk under their policies. Okay. That's my take on it all. Court, Kurt, let me know if I misstated what you put in that email. Well, the, the current standard is ambiguous. I mean, it's just. Well, the standard where? In the regs or in DPWs? Uh, the, the interface between the new development and the existing development. And for whatever reason, for all of the above, it, it's ambiguous and doesn't give us good guidance. In the, the regs. In, yeah. the, in, in the regs. Yep. Uh, but we're not going to solve that here. Right. Correct. That's that's not a project specific issue. It's a right. general issue that mm -hmm. affects the entire entire built. Yeah. This is this is our this project is the guinea pig. We're taking yep. lots of notes about where things aren't matching up with either you know policies or desires or just don't well, make sense. Well, well, it shows where where decisions made, uh, you know, without fully exploring the implications downstream, mm -hmm. you know, come back to bite us. And this yeah. is a classic example of that. Right. I'm sorry, Jane, what? Oh, when, when that development in Elizabeth Circle was, was constructed over 30 years ago with the plan to continue it, so that the sidewalks never interacted with the Hebert, you know, which many have suggested it should have. Right. But it's not... Did you have additional comments about sidewalks? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, so for this, for the sidewalk piece, we follow our um, complete streets report. I believe that's what it's called. And that cites uh, average, um, average day traffic volumes. I think from the development, they provide peak hour, which is what you use to look at the intersections. And we just don't know um, if the average daily traffic is going to hit the threshold identified within uh, that report to, to trigger the need for the sidewalk along the existing Isabel Circle parcel or development. Um, so the, I think the big takeaway is that DPW, like Meredith said, uh, is not going to recommend assuming ownership of the sidewalk within the new development unless there is connectivity. Um, and then, you know, it's really up to the board, I guess, um, about how to, you know, deal with that issue and the developer, um, you know, how much interest there is in DPW assuming that ownership. Um, right now I can say also that we do plan to construct sidewalk along Hebert. That is, that does meet the traffic volumes, um, to, uh, necessitate a sidewalk along Hebert road. Um, but along the existing Isabel circle, we, we do not know. And so, um, you know, that's not currently planned to be incorporated into the capital improvements plan for funding. Uh, the Hebert road piece will be, but, um, as of now, unless there's an update to the report, um, the Isabel, existing Isabel circle would not. Okay. Thank you. And if I can just comment, I mean, we acknowledge that the sidewalk would be taken care of privately. And, and that would, I would presume, be included in any homeowners right. association documents or covenants that have to be filed? That's correct. Okay. Paul, you had your hand up. Was that just for the, the note about um, being able to hear and get, get rid, see who is speaking? Uh, no, it, it was about the sidewalk, but uh, Mr. Lodge 
Indigenous uh, clarified. I was going to ask what what would happen if the city uh, rejected maintenance of that sidewalk, and he just clarified that uh, the homeowners association would be maintaining the sidewalk. So I think that covers it. Okay, sorry. Did you need to? No, it's great. It, it went away. So. I guess the only other outstanding uh, issue that I thought the board should talk about is um, whether we ask the developers to include in their either homeowner covenants or whatever um, uh, landscaping requirements for one and two family units, which are not normally required. Um, they, if they come back with a multifamily unit for three or three or more dwellings on a and then that uh, they will come in front of the board and there will be a landscaping requirement at that point. Um, interested in board thoughts about that? Do we want to, do we want to condition it in any way? Um, that was, that was a, something raised by staff that we could do. I think. Do we have similar uh, landscaping requirements for single family homes? Um, so, what the board has done before when we've had just the like two, you know, two or three sub parcel subdivisions um, is had a little statement in the decision that said if the um, later build on those vacant parcels came back and didn't um, otherwise trigger the full site plan landscaping requirements that they would have to come up with something to satisfy the subdivision landscaping requirements, which are really more about maintaining um, some sort of privacy with landscaping between the newly created parcels. Um, and so, you know, the landscaping plan that we have right now shows where there's going to be some existing trees retained and has proposals for street trees but there's going to be a lot of trees cut down to put in the stormwater um, mm -hmm. infrastructure that was going to get rid of trees on actual buildable parcels. Um, and so there's just because in section in this like, subdivision requirements, there is this requirement that you have some sort of plan for landscape buffers between your newly created parcels. Mm -hmm. um, so we've added that in before, but on the other hand, you know, it's it is a little heavy handed so, to require that for a single family trust. So it's sort of a it would problem. be required if they were going to develop all of it right now. Right. And that's not what they're doing. Right. They're, they're subdividing the lots but not building Right. And and the lot and many of them are going to be sold off. So right. then you know it requiring and, specific trees be planted before people figure out where they're going to put their houses. That would be odd. Seems a little odd. Yeah, wild. I mean, you say, saying, here's your new, here's the here's the deed to your new house. And by the way, here's a landscaping plan that you have to uh, implement right. before you move in. So then the question sort of becomes, do you want to put a condition that those people, when they come back for a permit to build a single or two family home, need to make sure they add landscaping? when that doesn't usually apply to a single or two family home. My, there, there are a lot of units here though. And if yeah. you have a scattered sort of incomprehensive uh, uh, grouping of, of different plans for different houses, I, I think I would be in favor of uh, of giving some general standards that should be met. And that's sort but, of what 3506 does. Right, but and, and that, that could be triggered at some certain point I mean, that would be triggered basically when they come for their permit to build the house, that yes. they have to have yeah, then a would... base level of landscaping. Right. And so that's just meeting the 3506. Yeah, I, I, guess... I, I, I do think the guidance is, is important. I, I, I guess I'm leaning a little bit the other way. Uh, just, just a little? Just a little. <laughs> I am, and I'm open. Uh, just uh, in terms of, you know, I realize that we have, um, that they have a lot of units and a lot of, um, a lot of lots. And at the same time, I sort of uh, 
don't like the idea of sort of requiring, you know. Yeah, I, I, I'm with here's, you on Here's that. your house, and now, and here's your here's your required landscaping plan. Um, so, so there are instances where the, a lack of guidance really uh, becomes problematic in terms of neighbor and neighbor. I I guess I'm leaning with Sharon then, um, mostly because this is also a completely self-contained development. No one existing is going to be able to see it. So everyone, you know, that's moving in there, it's going to, I don't think it's going to be as big of an issue. Um, also, people have a tendency to plant trees and things between their houses. And to, I just don't like the idea of mandating something when we don't even know when a house is going to get built there or where it's going to be. Or I, I, I was thinking if in like terms that. of some very general guidance, not something that's heavy handed. So can I? Seems like that's already covered, though. Well, but it, it so we wouldn't look at landscaping at all for most single and two family homes. Nothing. We don't we don't ask. We don't look. We don't care. Right. Um, so if we were to take even just part of the subdivision landscaping requirement, the one that seems to most pertain here because the um, larger development is going to take care of the, um, you know, stormwater infrastructure practices, um, any waterways, natural areas, that's going to be outside of the scope of where this is being built, where these are being built. Street frontage and shade trees and sidewalks are already going to be taken care of. So the last thing remaining really is to maintain and provide privacy both for adjoining property owners and between parcels within the subdivision. So that would be a potential to, to you could put a condition that later, that, that parcels that aren't otherwise covered by the larger landscaping provisions from site plan, um, when they come for their permits, need to have some sort of landscaping and screening plan to meet that privacy for adjoining property owners in between parcels. And then it kind of leaves it up to the discretion of the zoning administrator's office to look at the screening standards in the landscaping. Say, are you putting up some sort of fence or some, you know, some, a few trees, something along those boundaries now that we know exactly where you're putting your driveway and where you're putting your house. So that gives a general thing, a little bit of guidance. But, but on the other hand, that's also something that has to be caught and seen. And that's not something we require if you were to buy a random empty that's, lot right, for a that's, single family home. Exactly. All right. Yeah. But it is it is a subdivision standard, landscaping standard that's required, that's part of the subdivision you're approving right now. Right. That it says the subdivision applicant shall design the subdivision to maximize the preservation of existing mature vegetation and provide additional landscaping as necessary to all these other things. And it says the landscaping may be installed when parcels are subsequently developed. So trying to strike a balance here between what the regulations say you're supposed to do <laughs> and what you feel you want to do. <laughs> Can I, but can it's, I, it's, also, it's up to you guys, right? I rate the decision you tell me to write and can, work it through. Can I just make a comment? Yeah. You know, just thinking about the practicality of this, like I don't have any, like people are going to be building new homes in here, right? They're going to want to have screening. But I think there's a challenge when you don't know how the neighbor is going to cite their house, mm -hmm. like who's going to interpret that that's the proper screening, right? Until that next, Until the next, house that the next parcel has <laughs> been developed. It's a little bit challenging, I think, logistically, to be able to carry out what you're asking. I mean, I'm I'm like, I don't have any problem with screening, but I just think it could right. create some problems. Yeah. Uh, I'm do you guys speak up? Speak up in favor yeah. of the condition space. You're not in favor? No. Yeah. Okay. We still have Abby. We do. All right. Did you want to? Did Abby, have any thoughts? Abby, do you have any thoughts? I'm sorry, I'm missing you and not in the room. No, I don't. Thank you, Sharon. Okay. Yeah. It seems like we're sort of leaning towards not putting a condition on it. Would you, uh, that be workable for you, Kevin? Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay. I think that we, had a valuable discussion. 
in order to highlight the concern. Yeah. Um, so there was the outstanding slopes thing, which is kind of a, a administrative kind of issue. Right. Um, where the outstanding question is board to determine whether the information regarding steep slopes development, including narrative and engineering plans, is sufficient to comply with Section 3007 without requiring the explicit statement noted in Section 3007F4. Right. So when we've had other projects where usually it's a smaller, you know, the engineer isn't necessarily doing a whole lot of the planning, they're just contributing part of it for steep slopes. Um, we usually get a narrative statement from the engineer that's like a little letter that specifically says pretty much exactly what's in here that there there will be no um, there's no risk basically to the development on the sleep so steep slopes. Usually it's involving you know putting in a new building or a wall or something like that. Um, and so it doesn't say that it has to be a specific letter. It just says a written statement. And so my question for the board is basically do what we have before us, which involve engineers working on a lot of this, especially for the road, sufficient for you as the statement, or do you want the kind of letter we've been getting before? I, I, <laughs> I apologize if this hasn't been tidied up in the last two weeks. I don't, like the omission of it is not, we're not trying to not make the statement that you want. So um, if it, if I can read what I need to orally, like, it, it, doesn't, sound like, it doesn't sound like you'd have a problem signing a letter like that. No. <laughs> okay. I think it just be a condition of approval. I think like, along with the st signed stamped engineered plans. I just wanted to figure out what the board was comfortable with. I think as, I think as long as, I mean, my thoughts are, is that we've required a letter sort of stating this in the past that, and it's not going to provide any kind of hardship for you guys to provide that? No, I think I intended to meet all the requirements in zoning ordinance. And if we don't have the language I mean, that you're looking for, I think we can not provide a, it's it. It's not burdensome or onerous. I think let's, let's just include it. Keep it. More well, that also better. helps me for later uh, application packages okay. too. To right. also know, yep, I got to make sure I have that letter. Are there people who want to testify who have not spoken yet? Public comment. Um, yeah, I'm, I don't have any hands up. Okay. If you could, um, if you could just come up to the microphone and identify yourself, that'd be super. Vice Chair Adlin, board members, can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. My name is Ivan Brown, and my address is to Isabel Circle. I assume this is public comment time. I have read UDR, a Chapter 350, Section 3506A5. If this development were limited to 31 dwelling units or 40 dwelling units, 40 being a threshold in the UDR, I could see a waiver for a, a second access point. If one would even uh, be needed in those scenarios. However, this development is expected to create 57 dwelling units, which is way over 40. I don't see a well-grounded reason for a waiver for a second access point. Currently, we have 71 dwelling units served by the intersection of Hebert Road and Berlin Street. 57 additional dwelling units would cause an 80% increase. This is just top simple math here. 80% increase in the number of units served by that intersection. Hebert Road has a 19% slope at its approach to that intersection. That's not a number I made up. That's based on state LIDAR data. I also submitted a map uh, to the board as evidence uh, for that. So you add to this uh, intersection some queued vehicles, an icy road, a snowbank, 
taking more than four feet of roadway width. And what you have there is something that's way less than ideal. Back on March 11th, I measured that snowbank. 53 inches it extruded out into the uh, roadway. I submitted evidence of that to the board. But that was March 11th. That was between snowstorms. That was fair weather. We lost four and a half feet of roadway there, right there where things are going to theoretically get busy. And about these sidewalks on Hebert Road, unless I can go out there and tap my foot to a, like a, an actual sidewalk, it doesn't exist. So I have to process this as if the sidewalks aren't there. And the marginal traffic from 57 units would exacerbate conflicts on the neighborhood roadways, not just among vehicular traffic, but also between vehicular and non-vehicular traffic. And that's, that's all I came to, to say. Thank you. Thank you. It's, um, I'm just a little unsure that, um, that when information came in, was information on the traffic study done before the last hearing, or does that yeah. come in since? So the traffic study, the traffic study was part of the original packet. The original packet. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Sorry, because yeah, okay. you got you got everything. I got everything at once. All at once, so. and then reviewed the meeting. And okay. okay. Reporting and <laughs> so, yeah. so people, so people are aware of that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, other comments. Abby, did you have anything you want to add? Your face is up on our screen now. Take that as a no. I don't have any hands of anybody on. Oh, screen. great. Oh, yeah. Please come up and identify yourself. I'm Trish Eaton, and I'm at 29 Hebert Road, and uh, Isabel Circle comes right up into my driveway. <laughs> but I just thought I would let you know what I experienced earlier today. And uh, I was coming up from the bottom of Berlin Street and coming around, and traffic, you cannot see what is coming up Hebert Road to get onto Berlin Street. And uh, it makes it quite difficult. When you come around the corner, you cannot see what traffic is coming up Hebert. And sometimes I've ended up in the snowbank at the top of Hebert Road going down and saying, please, I don't want to go into the woods because there's not enough room on Hebert to really accommodate more than, like I say, two small compact cars at the same time. I have a Toyota 4Runner, and I'm telling you, when I'm going through there with another car coming up through, I'm in the snow with my car on the right-hand side, and then the other car, there's maybe this much room in between both cars passing at the same time. And I'm telling you, it gets scary, especially when it's icy, and uh, this afternoon, I had to um, make a trip out. And uh, lo and behold, got up to the top by Berlin Street, and there's traffic like anything. And so I'm waiting for the traffic, and the school bus is there. And uh, it's waiting to drop off the kids. So, okay, so here, finally, they get the kids all dropped off. And it comes up and the cars start moving. And there's no room for the bus to make it down onto Heber Road. And uh, it's just a real tight area up there. And uh, it's, like I say, it's not really wide enough. And if you have construction vehicles coming up and that being the only access road, you got to be real careful or if you're going to find yourself screwed. Okay, thank so you. I just thought I would give that thank thank information. You. Thank you. Any hands up on your board? I don't. 
Sharon, can I? To, um, mm -hmm. I, I was going to suggest that we close the public hearing and then take it into the public hearing. I'm sorry, can I? I He's suggesting that, that, that if everybody feels like they have enough information to make a decision, that the decision be a deliberative session. Uh, I guess I can um, we can talk about that as a board whether we want to go into deliberative session to make the decision or um, I am well. There's, there's so a few that, different. Are we at that? Are we at the point where we? Do people feel like they have enough? Do we? Yeah. I I feel like we have answered the questions that were out there and that um that I have a pretty good understanding of what they're proposing. Yeah. Um, do you want to just check in with Abby, make sure she heard that? Abby, are you still with us? That You're was... muted. You look good, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, she may be having issues because I know she's remote. She is traveling, so. so. Oh, is she driving right now? Oh. So yeah, she may have she may have lost some contact. That's what I think. But we still have enough for decision, even if we lose Abby altogether. I'm not seeing any other outstanding matters that haven't been touched on. Um, I don't know if the applicant has well, anything we, to we, add. We should we should be very thorough with that because if we yeah. close, then no, I'm, that's, I'm trying to go through. Right. Right. I'm trying to capture everything in the memos. Um, yeah. Does, do we want to see if the applicant has anything to? Do you have anything that you'd like to add, or any other questions, or concerns, or comments, or just to, just to say, you know, the city is just really great to work with, and so we appreciate we, you know, been having meetings all throughout this and being able to clarify uh, and make sure that you know we just adjusted things as needed to be, and uh, grateful for all of you being here tonight. You know, I'm certainly if a board members feel strongly about going into a deliberative session, I'm open to that. I don't I don't well uh, my my reason for suggesting it is that once we close the public hearing and we we have to be very certain that we in fact have covered all the bases here, anything that's come up or has come to our attention. Um, but of course the purpose for going into deliberative sessions, because there's a lot of technical aspects that need to be worked into to the decision. And that just allows us the freedom to do that. Um, yeah, I mean, if there's strong feeling in any other way, we, we should talk about that. But that's my suggestion. I'm just going through to make sure that any potential conditions are dealt with and captured. Um, you know, there's nothing missing. I'm not seeing anything missing that hasn't been addressed from the prior stack report or the memo. But I mean, the, um, the things that we that that I think need to be added to the, or that we need to be clear on in the decision is that the applicant was going to um, provide the Department of Public Works with um, what catchment they thought the water was going to flow to and that they're going to do that. Um, and I can, we can add that. Do you want that as a condition that's prior to permit issuance or just a condition of approval? Because it could- We don't require design past the 25 year storm. So I think a condition- for, It's a condition of approval yeah. versus prior to permit issuance. Fine. Um, and then adding the written engineer statement of no undue adverse effect to the prior to permit issuance set, which goes with the signed and sealed engineered plans. That's all prior to permit issuance. Um, um, I'm going to take out the written approval of final landscaping plan by the tree board because we got the tree board's input. Yep. Mm -hmm. um. I think that we also want to add, um, just make sure that it's clear that the uh, that the 
ownership uh, association documents, et cetera, uh, need to include responsibility for um, sidewalks. Mm -hmm. Yep, as well as the maintenance of parcel 34 is open space that one can stay in here on the staff report, but add in responsibility for sidewalks. Until such time uh, as or if city Applicants for it to be declared in that stormwater where the stormwater will hit existing city catchment. I have a question before we before mm -hmm. yeah. this. Um, based on uh, just speak up. Yeah, some of the public comments and concerns, and I don't know, Meredith, if, if some of them were were there were a lot of them were questions when you submitted today, addressed to are, you. Are you. Sorry, are you talking to me or are you talking to? Uh, me? Well, there was uh, some both. I mean, okay. So there was some questions from public concerns and comments that were addressed to you and, and were, that were submitted publicly. I don't right. know if those were answered or there was any... Do um... you mean the most recent ones? Yes. Okay, so right. So I sent the most recent comments. Thank you, Jean, about that. We did get um, emailed comments um, from Rachel Caravo and from Eve Jacobs Carnahan. Um, I did forward those to the board and I forwarded them to the applicant. Um, and the ones that were specifically about um, sidewalk concerns um, and Department of Public Works um, policies with regard to um, when sidewalks are required. Um, I did send that on to DPW as well because it seemed to be more about a DPW policy. Um, so uh, the Ms. Jacobs Carnahan's comments um, were, were in response to the memo from the Department of Public Works. Um, and I think there was a little confusion because she seemed to comment about DPW not being in favor of sidewalks in the new development versus I think what DPW was expressing was that under their current policy um, and plan, the new development wouldn't have warranted sidewalks under the complete streets plan, but the subdivision required our subdivision it's standards relevant. require them. Yeah. So, so that I mean, that was that was that was basically addressed separately. Great. Um, but she did also have a note there though that um, it didn't make sense to her to ask the developer to put in sidewalks on the streets leading to this new new development. Um, that was something a little bit new in here. Um, you know, she was supportive of those sidewalks being added inside, but that building new you know sidewalks on say existing isabel circle was something that um she thought it, it made sense to to leave that for city DPW. city deep you know, city budget issues and later correct um which is where it would fall right which is where it would fall yeah. that would be later um as well as you know potentially with some other future you know the mou which would probably as as kurt said have a requirement that the city wouldn't take over maintenance of the new Isabel Circle Loop sidewalks until there was a connection. So that that adds some impetus there. Um, for Rachel Caravu, um, those were comments. She lives at 28 Isabel Circle, and she had a variety of concerns about um, traffic, um, which are similar to some we've heard before, um, and about uh, whether the construction um, process would damage existing roadways 
Um, and there's a question here about how the current end of is this bell circle would be handled, but I think that was a little bit of confusion about the process mm -hmm. because um, with the new loop being built, once that's built, there will be a turnaround there at the end. People will just drive around the loop because it's not going to be, it's not going to be a private road. It's going to be a public road eventually. Um, and even, even then it's not like you're going to put a gate up that says nobody can come and use the loop because right. that, would, that, be, that was... would be difficult for, you know, even just package delivery purposes, you'd be blocking off your own, I, own I development. That was my, my, Okay. Question. That was a clear, yeah, just to clarify and make sure that there was clarity with, with the public. Yeah, and make sure people, yeah, usually yeah. I try to remember to, to comment on these last minute um, inputs so that it's clear and on the record and not just in the paper file. So thank you, Jane. I got kind of lost in the minutia of everything else. Um, and then some of these others in here from, from Rachel were similar to some of the other ones we've heard about the plowing issues. Um, you know, there were a few other things about, about water sewer, but that's not a cost that's going to be, um, ho hooking them up to something and extending the water lines and everything is a cost that you've already factored in. <laughs> and Gabe, for anybody remotely, Gabe's nodding, um, the applicant. So, all good, Gene? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. I'd like to welcome a motion to move forward. To, to do a motion for them? Yes. Oh. To so are you the 34 lot subdivision on parcel ID. Can you um, can you speak up? Right? No, what's, what, what's the staff report now? Is it yes, I know, but it's okay. going to be according. I just want to welcome the motion. Oh. Yeah. I suppose I could make it. Huh? Um, I think it, so. It sounds like the board is willing to entertain a motion at this point. Is that correct? Without a deliberate session, are yeah. you are you still? Is that a possibility for you, Kevin? Are you oh. concerned about the that we may be missing something? I, I I'm more comfortable by by making sure that we have all of the I's dotted and T's crossed, uh, and I think that's the reason for going into deliberative. Uh, okay. session but you know uh, if the board feels that uh, we don't uh, need to do that I'll, I'll go along with that okay I feel, I feel like I guess my feeling is that um that there were some things that we needed to hammer out but we just did yeah um that and everybody should know what we're hammering out so there's no real reason to go into deliberative session to do that I Correct. like to do it I like to do it here when we can um just for transparency's sake. Uh, so it is a complicated motion to make. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, Go ahead. It's, uh, it's all noted. It will be noted by staff. I think you so got all of it. You can't make them. I can't make the motion. Well, we need to craft the motion. Well, it's, it's I've made notes. If somebody wants to try and read my scribble. They're welcome to. <laughs> I mean, I think I think we're all Thanks, in, same just in terms of what what the conditions are. Yeah, I'm trying to read the whole thing. All right. So thank you, Joe. Make sure you can do the writing. Absolutely. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> My lawyer's scribble doesn't help me. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. But I just think as a procedural. Um, approach. Well, it's just about the, the transfer of yeah, the sidewalks to the ownership. Yeah, for yeah, I think we might have a large, city. Yeah, we're filled with like a large or something. Well, either, either way, we're going to bring the same place. So there's no so, yeah. connection. Yep. They'll look at it. But it all right. Can I get ready to make a motion? A uh, motion to approve the 34 lot subdivision of parcel ID number 072-00J000 and major site plan approval for the associated infrastructure necessary for additional development of the new parcels as presented in application number Z-2023-0011 in supporting materials subject to the following conditions of approval. One. Prior to permit issuance, 
applicant shall provide the zoning administrator with the following a assigned and sealed engineered set of plans as specified by the board during the public hearing and written engineer's statement of no undue adverse effect. Two, uh, within 180 days of this decision, applicants shall record the owner's association documents detailing ownership, access, and maintenance rights and responsibilities for commonly owned or maintained property and infrastructure, and the final survey plat, including the locations of all applicable survey rods and markers in the Montpelier Land Records Office per the procedures detailed in Section 4405 of the Zoning Regulations. Three. The owner's association document shall include responsibility for sidewalks until such time as or if city has agreed agreement otherwise. So somebody can amend that if they need to. You can re you can rephrase. <laughs> Essentially, the you will take on responsibility of the sidewalks until the city takes on responsibility of the sidewalks. Is that yeah? Sum it up. Okay. Basically, and I can phrase it slightly differently in the. Final decision if you need me to, and it'll say essentially that. All right. And B of three, common responsibility for maintenance of parcel 34 as open space available for at least passive recreation, including that paths and meadows be mowed or brush hogged regularly. Four, prior to beginning construction, the applicant shall provide the zoning administrator with a copy of the state construction general individual permit to demonstrate compliance with sections 3008. And five, applicant to provide DPW with clarity on where stormwater will connect. connect with existing city catchments. I think that's everything. I think that is. I heard a lovely motion. Good job, Joe. A second. Second. Uh, any further discussion? Starting with my... Gentleman on the right, Gene, how do you vote? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Yes. Abby? Yes. And I vote yes as well. That is unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Okay. Uh, so just a reminder, the written decision is what actually starts the appeal period. We will get the written decision to you as soon as possible. Um, technically, we have up to 40, well, the board has up to 45 days to get it to you, but we all work really hard to have that happen much sooner. Um, and then, and you, you've heard the conditions. Um, you're free to begin working on the prior to permit issuance conditions as soon as you want. So if I get those uh, before the decision gets signed, the zoning permit will get issued at the same time. Otherwise, there'll be a lag between the decision getting issued and the permit getting issued. Thank you. Thank you. Um, other and business. Thank you, Kurt. Yeah, thanks, Kurt. Um, do we have other business uh, for this evening? Do we need to make a motion to close the hearing or did I just do that? Uh, we basically kind of did that with the motion to Approved. Approved. Okay. That closed it. Sure. Yeah. Um, so our next meeting will be April 3rd. Uh, do, we, um, do we have anything on the agenda for that? We do. Okay. We do have an application for April 3rd. It's on our pending applications page. So feel free to take a peek at it. Um, it is a um, Westview Meadows is looking to add sort of a garden shed, but they have an odd parcel. And so trying to put it where their people can actually get to it gets a little funky. So um, yeah, have fun taking a peek at that one. Um, also, just thank you everybody for showing up tonight and your comments. It's always great when people show up and are involved in this process. Thanks to those of you who showed up online as well. I would take a motion to adjourn if we are so inclined. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.